Paul, could I get you to open with prayer? Thanks, mate. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are here this morning, that we were able to arrive here safely. Um, none of us ran out of petrol. I'm pretty sure none of us are hungry here, Lord. Uh, none of us were abused or, or thrown things at on our way here. Lord, we are so blessed in this country, and I pray that that is something that we consider and we ponder and we are thankful for. We thank you that we can come here. We thank you we have your word. We thank you that it is something that we can carry around with us, that we can bring it here, that we can open it, and that we can hear from you. And I pray for Bill as he's been studying, as he's been sort of mining the word and looking for things to, to present to us. May you hide him behind the cross. Give him clarity of thought. Help him to say the things that you would have him say, whether they are convicting or edifying, Lord, that we will also listen and that we will hear and that we will uh, apply these truths to our lives, Lord, that we won't just forget about it when we leave the doors, but we will ponder this, we will speak speak to each other about it, to our children, to our wives, to our family, Lord, and help this word to grow. Thank you that we can uh, be here. Help us to pay attention. In your name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Paul. I like what Paul said, that when we leave here, take the time to spend time with brothers and sisters in Christ and talk over what has been spoken. Encourage one another in the way of the Lord. Okay, do I get an amen to that? Amen. Oh, good on you. That's what I like. Okay, our sermon topic today is everlasting life. I'm not going to go around you, but if someone was to walk up to you and ask you, an unbeliever, and said, what is everlasting life? Do you truly understand what everlasting life is? And when was the last time you read your Bible about everlasting life? And you see, as we go through today, I'm going to encourage you 100% to continue to do it. As we go through this sermon, I urge you to consider what is currently happening, happening in the world today with reference to the coronavirus. The deaths, loved ones dying, elderly, even some young ones. What is your understanding on the coronavirus? I don't need you to call that out. I want you to understand the suffering that is going on at the moment. And you've only got to look at the television or hear the radio and you'll see what's going on. I hope this message today will encourage you. Encourage you to reach out and pray for your family, your friends, your workmates, be active in your Christian faith. And I pray that God's name will be glorified through that. Well, indeed, welcome everybody. Our sermon today is from John 3, 25 to 36. So if you've got your Bible with you, can I encourage you to open it up? John 3, 25 to 36. And as a lead-in to our sermon, those passages that I, or that passage I just told you to look up. In Romans 8, 30, 30, uh, 8 and 39, the Apostle Paul quotes the following verses. You can look at that if you wish. In verse 38, For I am persuaded. Now, if you're a Christian here and you've been around for a while, I should be able to point at you and ask you to recite it. This is one, two verses here that you should know. It should be installed in your heart that when you're challenged or asked about your faith, these two verses are critical to support you in doing that. So let's have a look at it if you wish. John 8, 38 to 39, Apostle Paul quotes the following in these verses. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities, I'll give you the wrong ones. No, you got it? Nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Family, I can't encourage you enough. I know I sound loud, but believe you me, this is nowhere near what I can reach. This is so critical in the Christian walk. And I'm not going to embarrass you, but I will say, when did you last read that? When did you last get excited about reading what Paul wrote there? Of course, they do encourage us, those sort of words. Folks, these words spoken by Paul are of great importance to the Christian. They should encourage us very much so in our Christian walk. I can't stress that enough. 
Can I suggest that these words are read regularly in our Christian life to remind us, for indeed, now listen to this comment, for indeed we can be likened to leaking water tanks, a tank that's got a leak at the bottom. And you know the story there, okay? And if the problem is not addressed, in other words, if the hole is not plugged up, what will happen to the water in the watering tank? It will run out and eventually go dry. So, for indeed we can liken, uh, liken ourselves to a leaking water tank and if the problem is not addressed, the problem of our faith, the not remembering things that we should remember, okay, we will run dry. Who's ever run dry in their faith? Who's ever been challenged and can't remember the words? Okay, can I really encourage you, liken it to the water tank. The answer to the water tank is to do what? Plug it up. Don't let the water run out. So how do we plug ourselves up? What do you reckon we can do if we don't continue to feed? I haven't got the Bible with me here. But if we don't continue to feed on the Word, what happens? We dry out. So what's the answer to that? Liken it to the tank. We read the Word. And don't give up. Yes, that's exactly right. To stop the words from disappearing from us. Family, I can't stress that enough. Not unless it's just me. I know I'm getting on, I'm 72. Maybe it's just me that suffers with lack of memory of these things. Oh, I don't think I am. I encourage you. Learn from the old chook up the front, huh? Don't run out. Refill yourself with the word. Okay? So, our, our message today is on everlasting life. And I hope you are, you are encouraged. I mean that uh, seriously. I hope you can bounce out of here this morning excited about knowing that, yep, I'm glad he spoke about the water tank because I'm feeling a bit dry. And I hope you get topped up here this morning. Okay, the sermon today comes from John 3, 25 to 36. So please turn there, follow through if you're able to do so. I'll read through the passage first and then we'll come back and develop it by verse. Starting at verse 25. And by the way, who wrote these verses? John. John who? <laughs> who did John become? Apostle. Apostle. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So you all with me? Okay. So starting at verse 25. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples. John who? Is he the fisherman? No. Who is this John? Pat. Baptist. I couldn't say it. Baptist. Yeah, John, you said Baptist then. John the Baptist. Guys, two Johns in this passage. Don't get mixed up who we're talking about. There's John the Apostle who wrote it down, and there's John the Baptist who's the bike we're talking about. So let's read this. These verses read as follows in, 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 um, in our subject text, John 3.25 starting there. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. Did you ever ask yourself, I don't need you to call out, but did you ever ask yourself, I wonder what that was about? One what could have caused that? Okay, look at the next verse. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with, with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. So what sort of picture are you picking up there? Don't call it out. It sounds like something's wrong. Sounds like there's a little bit of, um, starts with J and it sounds like jealousy. Jealousy going on here, well let's find out. Okay, and they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. And in verse 27, John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. And following on to the next verse, you yourselves bear me witness that I said, he had already told them this, and he reaffirms it again, you yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He carries on in the next verse, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoices greatly. 
Because of the bridegroom's voice, this my joy therefore is fulfilled. And in verse 30, have a look at this. John's purpose, I'm not going to get you to call it out, but what was the purpose of John Baptist? And have a look at these words. He must increase, but I must decrease. He carries on in verse 31. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And he carries on, and what he hath seen and heard, now please note this verse, this is something that you should really pay attention to. This verse is absolutely essential to the Christian, and what he hath seen and heard, who is he? Have a guess, who's the he in that verse, and what he hath seen and heard? Jesus, he, that, what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man receive his testimony. We'll develop that in a minute. And in verse 33, he that hath received his testimony has said to his seal that God is true. Do you believe that God is true? Don't call it out. Answer that in your hearts. Have you said him to your seal, Jesus Christ? For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hands. And we see 36, our last verse in the sermon text. He that believeth the Son hath everlasting life. Now listen to this, everyone, because we're going to develop it anyway. Hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God of the wrath of God abide upon him. I really encourage you to read those words. Don't just listen to me. Go home and take your family to it and encourage it. Plough the field. Plough the field. Sink the plough down deeper. That was one of my old sayings from the front. Sink it down deeper. All right. John 25. Right back to the start of this section. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying what the precise subject of this dispute was, we do not know. But we can guess. It carries on in, in the study that I've got. From, from what follows, it would seem probable that it was about the comparative value and effect of the baptism performed by John and by the disciples of Jesus. The word purifying may be applied to baptism as it was an emblem of repentance and purity and was thus used by the Jews, by John and by Jesus. About the subject, it seems that dispute arose, carried to such an extent that obviously a complaint was made to John. That's how bad it is. You ever seen examples of that in our church? In the Christian church of our day? Someone doesn't get it their way and what happened? Before you go, you've got half the church fight the other half. We're going to learn from that, and we'll find out in a minute. Verse 26, and they came unto John and said, now listen to this, read your words, and they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. That should start to give you an indication of how they feel. They've got their nose out of joint. The, 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 John Baptist's um, people, okay. That is, they came to G. They cut. Sorry, they came to John Baptist with their complaints, envious, jealous at the success of Jesus, and ever, evidently irritated from the discussion, as if their master John was about to lose his popularity. All men come to Jesus was the cry. This was the source of their difficulty, and we'll, we'll deal with that all men come to Jesus in a minute. So here we have a bunch of guys who are with John Baptist. John Baptist has already told them why he's here, and they've got their nose in it. To the extent where they went and complained, and they're afraid they were going to lose their popularity. Just think about it for a minute. It was because Jesus was gaining popularity that the people flocked to him. 
The followers of John feared that he would be forsaken, resulting in, uh, resulting in them being dismin uh, diminished in numbers and influence. Folks, this is not the spirit of the gospel. We should be rejoicing when we run into brothers and sisters in Christ, irrespective if they come to this church, an independent Baptist church, or just happens to be a faithful Bible-believing church down the road, is not named the same as us. I don't believe we've got any right to throw stones. And certainly from what I read here, okay, this is not the spirit of the gospel. We have to be friends with our brothers and sisters in Christ and love them. Those who are truly faithful and live a Christian life. True faith, listen to this, true faith teaches us to rejoice that sinners turn to Christ and become holy. If I run into Paul down the road, let's just say Paul doesn't come here, and I know he's a born-again Christian, and I run into him and I haven't seen him for a while, I should rejoice. I should be grateful. I've run into a brother in Christ and be encouraged by one another. That's what it's about. Not pointing fingers, okay, encouraging one another. Faith is complete trust and conf or confidence of the supreme being and love of his character. Let Jesus be exalted and let men turn to him is the language of religion. In verse 27, John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Did you notice? John did not enter the, into, into their feelings or sympathise with them. He didn't join into the fight because he knew it was wrong. He didn't want to get in there and whinge and moan and carry on like an old chook. He didn't join the fight. He came to honour Jesus, not to build up a sect. He rejoiced at the success of the Messiah and began to teach his followers to rejoice in it also. John quoted to them, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. All success is from heaven. John's success came from God. Jesus' success also comes from God. John is encouraging his followers, stop dropping your left, stop getting grizzly about what's going on with Jesus. Okay? John is encouraging his followers and makes it clear to them as success comes from the same source. We ought not to be envious. And I think that's important, seriously. I know in the years that Bev and I have tried as Christians from Weeper to New Zealand, even to here, we've seen cases of exactly that. That's not the spirit of Christ. So we need, really need to think about that. Verse 28, you yourselves bear me witness. He's capping it off again. He's reinforcing the information to them again. Of course, we are all like people who do forget at times. It's not only this old fire up the front. Even your young people forget things at times. So let's encourage one another. And he says here, look at him, ye yourselves bear me witness, says John Baptist, that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. John reminds his followers by, the, by his statement previously spoken to them, do you remember, says John, that at first I told you I was not the Messiah? They'd forgotten it. They'd forgotten why John had come. Or it didn't bother them. No, they got their nose out of joint. I am witness to Jesus, says John. I have come for no other reason, says John, but to point Jesus to the Jews and that they ought not to suppose that John was Christ's superior. John came to point to Christ. And that's what he's... Uh, his disciples should have been doing. They should have been encouraging people by pointing them to Christ. It was but reasonable to expect that Christ himself would be more successful than his forerunner. John clearly declares this to his followers so that there would be no misunderstanding. We don't want another situation like John's disciples going on in our churches. We need to have a sure understanding of who we trust and believe in. And it's only Christ, Christ only. I came not to form a separate party. I can see, just visualise that, John speaking out those words, John Baptist speaking his words out to his, to his people. I came not to form a separate party, a particular sect, but to prepare the way for Jesus. 
that he might be more successful, that the people might be ready for his coming and that he might have the success which he actually met with. So you see how things start to go wrong, can't you? All of a sudden, because of pride, John, John the Baptist people get a bit toey about it. Jesus makes it clear to them, you should rejoice at that success. And in verse 29, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. We could say there that John was excited about what he was hearing. About, about the apostles. Oh, not the apostles. About, about the, the story of the message getting out about Jesus. This is an illustration drawn from marriage. The bride belongs to her husband. So the church, the bride of the Messiah, belongs to him. It is, it is to be expected, therefore, and desired that people should flock to him, flock to Jesus. The relation of Christ to the church is often compared to the marriage relation. So listen to this one, guys. Denoting the tenderness of the union and his great love for his people. So we are to be tender, guys, and ladies to one another. You heard me? The relation of Christ to the church is often compared to uh, the marriage relation, denoting tenderness of the union and with great love for his people. You and I are supposed to have tenderness for our bride, for our husband, for our family, and great love for them. In verse 30, he must increase. This is John. He must increase, but I must decrease. Why? Why must he decrease? Because he came to lift up Christ, not to lift himself up. He must increase, says John. Jesus' authority and influence among the people must grow. Jesus' words and teachings shall, shall continue to spread till it extends throughout the whole earth. It needs people like you and I to take the time talking to people at work, at home, grabbing every opportunity. Someone ever says to you at work, hey, what's this about your faith? Don't ever let that go. Be kind and generous and share the gospel message with people. Okay, Jesus' words and teachings shall continue to spread until it extends throughout all the earth. I must decrease, said John, because it's not my role. My role is to lift up Christ, not to form a sect, not to form another party, but to be a person who does the job that God has required him to do, to lift up Christ. The purpose of my ministry is to point men to him. John says my teaching must cease when Jesus is fully established. Boy, what a way to cease. What happened to John? How did John finish his life? Yeah, down come the sword. What a way to finish. John says my teaching must cease when Jesus is fully established. Verse 31, he that cometh from above, he that uh, cometh from above is above all, he that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. Here John quotes the Messiah is represented as coming down from heaven. Jesus is above all in nature, rank and authority. Jesus is superior to all prophets, to all angels, angels and is over the, over the universe as its sovereign Lord. Verse 32 of our sermon text, And what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man receive his testimony. I want to pull you up for a minute, look at those words in your Bible, and understand it. What does that say to you? And what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. What does it mean, and what he hath seen and heard? He's from heaven. He's been sent by God the Father. Okay, and what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth of, no man received his testimony. And you see in a minute that that's not right, that statement there. No man receiveth his testimony. The words, I'll tell you right now, the words no man are here to be understood in sense as a few. Of all the millions, all the people in Jesus' time, the feeding of the thousands, the, the raising of the dead, all of those things would be 
Unreal to see, and I think you and I can agree with that. Well, out of all of those, not many people find it. They were there for the, for the handouts, but not many people chose to follow him. And only a few. Though his doctrine is pure and plain, yet few comparably received it in faith. Though multitudes came to him drawn by various motives, yet few became his real disciples. His testimony, his doctrine, the truth to which he bears witness, as having seen and known. We should be excited about that, those words. He said that he's known it, he was there. He was with there with God the Father in heaven. And in verse 33 of our subject text, he that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. That is, he that has received Jesus' testimony and has received and fully believed his doctrine and hath yielded his heart to its influences. Believing a doctrine, therefore, in the heart is expressed by sealing it. Or by believing it, we express our firm conviction that it is true. And that God has, and that God who has spoken it is true. It is a solemn act to become a Christian, folks. It truly is. It is a surrender of all to God to do away with those things that aren't worthy of the kingdom of God in our lives or giving away body soul, and sp uh, body, soul and spirit to him with the belief that he is true and alone he is able to save. The man that does not do this, that is not willing to pledge his belief that God is true, sets to his seal that God is a liar. How does that sting you? The person who does not agree with it, okay, sets to his seal that God is a liar and is unworthy of confidence. Another example of this is found in 1 John 5.10. You can turn to that if you wish. And verse, that's just that one verse. Which reads, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not, he that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. Boy, I hope there's no one in here today who's like that. If not, I pray people will work with you in a courage. Our next verse is 34 from our subject text. And John says, For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. Whom God has sent, that is Jesus Messiah. Jesus speaketh the words of God, the truth or commands of God. Though Jesus was God as well as man, Yet as mediator, God anointed him or endowed him with the influences of his spirit so as to be completely qualified for his great work. By measure. If I was to say to you, by measure, some of us may get it right, some of us may get a different opinion of it, but by measure, that is not in a small degree, but fully, completely. He got the light from God the Father. And when you say to you know, it's just our lives, you say measure, you're talking about a length or something or a small amount. No, he got the life. And um, the Father loved the Son from eternity, as he was his Son by eternal generation. God the Father had a special love and affection for Christ, not only in regard of his eternal sonship, but with respect to his office and mediatorship. The Father loveth the Son, and he hath given all things into his hands. That is, he hath entrusted him with all things necessary to our salvation, Jesus. In verse 36, the last verse of our subject text, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. You beauty. I hope a number of people in here can say, Thank you, God, as I truly believe in you. He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. Oh, but read the next bit. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. I pray, if you're unsaved, I pray that these words would cause you to seek help and reach out to Christian brothers and sisters in Christ and get them to guide you. Read your Bible. I can't make it any clearer than that. Okay? He that believeth not the Son of God 
shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him uh, forever. The comet hath the everlasting life, that is, has or in the possession of that which is a recovery from spiritual death. So if you're not saved, you're not recovered from spiritual death. So it's important to think about that, and which will result in eternal life. Oh, hang on. Uh, which is a recovery from spiritual death and which would result in spiritual life in heaven so those who get saved. The Christian here has a foretaste of the world to come, the glory, the world of glory, and enjoys the same kind of intense happiness through not, although not the same degree, here on planet Earth. So in other words, what you enjoy here now is going to be a lot better in heaven if you're saved. The comet shall not see life, the unbeliever states, Apostle John, shall neither shall neither uh, enjoy true life or, or happiness here nor in the world to come. Now, listen to this. Folks, and I don't mean to, to, to sound horrible or rude or anything like that, but it's true. And I really want you to hear it. The unbeliever shall never enter heaven. That's not hard to understand, is it? If you're not saved, you're not going to heaven. So please do everything possible to get saved. So now on to the conclusion. You did it, that's it. I heard it all happen. I heard you man. Okay, so now on to the conclusion. Our sermon today was from John 3, 25 to 36. The title of the sermon was... What was the title of the sermon today? Thank you, Sister of Christ. Thank you. I'm just checking to hit this thing. Everlasting life. I cannot encourage you enough to reread these verses. I mean it seriously. Because we can be likened to... Right at the beginning, what could we be likened to? A hole in the water tank, and if the water keeps running out, what's going to happen? You're going to run dry. So how do we stop ourselves from running dry as a Christian? What do you reckon? Come on, sister, give me an answer. What can we do? Read the Word. Feed on it. Don't give up. Put your Donald Ducks down, or any other book you read. Read the Word. Feed on it. And that's the way you won't run dry. So I cannot encourage you enough to reread these verses. But not only you, you mums and dads have got young ones, I hope you're doing that. I hope you're sharing with your family from an early age, instilling into them the message of salvation. They will greatly assist you in your Christian walk with any struggles that you may encounter. And believe you me, we all have struggles. I finish with the words, you beauty, they said. I finish with the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, written down by John, you can turn to this, John 14, 6. Jesus saith to him, you should have this written on your fridge, your children should be able to quote it, you should be able to quote it, and it should stand out like a dog's leash. So when you have an unsaved person come into your house, don't be ashamed to have it on the fridge and tell them to go and get a drink. Encourage them. You should all know this, you should know it all off by heart. Okay, so let's see it. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Come on, bark it out, say to me. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the way. By this is meant, doubtless, that they and all others uh, were to have access to God only by obeying the instruction. Okay, what has been said? I am the way. All right. I'm going to let you have peace. I'm going to leave it with you. Family, I really want to encourage you. I, I've gone through that in a readable pace. But I can't stress it enough. You know, certainly I can refer to life, those things that were so easy, you can just click your fingers, like Paul's age. Click your fingers and remember, when you get around my age, things start to change. Things start to drift away. And the only way you can keep the water tank topped up, how can you do it, Tara? How can you do it? You fill it up. And block the hole. Block, block the hole in the tank first. Okay, grab your red hymn books and um, 